Yeah, sorry. Check it, check it, check it, check, check, it works. Okay, friends, gonna get started in one second. Let me just fix one more thing. Okie dokie. Hi, friends. How's it going? Welcome back to Attack the Pantry. That's the name of this stream. I'm Jen De La Vega. This is a deep dive into ingredients, cooking techniques, and recipes to help you cook for yourself during quarantine and, you know, the rest of your adult life. Um, last time we talked about melons and seeds, cucurbits is the, the scientific name, and the, uh, what is it, the genus is. Cucurbitaceae. <laughs> it's really hard to say. Um, oh no, I hope you didn't get banned from chat. Hello, everybody. Sorry, okay, let me just tell you that uh, I took a little bit longer to get set up today because I spent a lot of last night trying to configure the chat. Hi, Lucius. Hi, Schmaz. Uh, sorry, Keen. Uh, I do have some, like, bad words banned so maybe if you typed it <laughs> you might have been like timed out but I'll, I'll check on the settings after the stream i'm really sorry that you got timed out you put in the corner i'm sorry <laughs> um but yeah you'll notice that there's new um stream elements in the chat at the bottom, like underneath the screen, like underneath my video screen here, you can see like I added a new box 
that says chat commands. And so if you're new to Twitch, you can do exclamation point and then a command and it will do something in the chat. So I have three of them activated right now. They're going to be more later on, but I have a magic eight ball. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, if you do exclamation point commands, you can you can check out that list that Lucius just shared in the chat. But the three one three of them that I activated is uh, magic eight ball. So anytime we have a question in the on the stream, or I just say something out loud, you can just magic eight ball it, and it will give you an answer. Why does it say broke back? I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I need to I need to fix this. There's a lot of configuring I still need to do here. I think some of them have automatic answers like um like emotes and emoji, so we can customize it to be all food related. But I just wanted to like test it out and see if it worked. Apparently it works. Okay, we got a real answer there. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Um, I also made a custom one called Snack Check, and let's do that. I'll do that one right now. Snack Check. Snack Check, Snack Check. What are you snacking on right now? So that's going to be unique to my stream. I thought that was really cute. If you have any other ideas for what we can do in the chat, like I will happily integrate it. <laughs> as long as it helps the discussion along. Oh, you're having some tots, huh? I love that. I don't really have anything snacky. I have a show and tell later for when we get to uh, the hot sauce segment of today. But uh, yeah, so before I get to talking a whole hell of a lot about chili peppers and hot sauce, just some, some business about the stream. Um, I'm a Twitch affiliate, meaning that if you subscribe to this channel, uh, it gives me a little bit of money every week. And did you know that it's September? Subscriptions on Twitch are 30% off, so it's kind of the best month to up your subscriptions across all of Twitch. Um, lots of good links below the video here. I have a Patreon, I have an Etsy store, I have all sorts of things to, you know, to check out. But uh, let's see, on Patreon this week, I think I'm on Skate Video 29. Um, I found a new spot to skate in in my neighborhood. It's a little shady, but I'm alive. Um, some news about Fun City, which is a podcast I'm on. We are postponing uh, the release for this Friday. Um, we just sort of, uh, you know, we were, we were producing normally during quarantine, and it's sort of catching up to us right now. So a lot of us are uh, focusing on work, taking breaks, and uh, we couldn't get it edited in time. So we hope you understand, but uh, we'll be back with a new episode next week. Um, and we hope that, you know, you've built up a backlog because our first Steel Fleet episode was like two hours. So I mean, it's a lot of stuff to listen to. Um, so, yeah, that's the update on that. Um, culinary word of the day. Number 10 is coming out tomorrow. Uh, I worked on video versions of culinary word of the day. So they are now captioned and um, accessible on YouTube. Uh, I have to thank my friend Chris DePew for helping me put those together. If you're looking for somebody that knows, if, if you're looking to hire somebody that knows After Effects, Chris was super fast and like helped me put the whole thing together. I'm really, really excited about it. Um, you can follow our Twitter account at twitter.com slash culinary WOTD for that podcast. All right. Whoa, you made a s'more in the microwave? Hell yeah. I, I tend to just torch them with my kitchen torch directly. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, you got tapioca in your coffee? And a margarita pizza layered onto salad pizza for lunch. Oh my god. Yo, you are living. Yeah, oyster mushrooms can be a snack. Or you're currently cooking it for dinner. Is that what you're doing? That's cool, too. I'm making pho tonight, so I have, like, a beef broth going in my slow cooker. I'm very excited about it. It's pretty warm in New York, um, and I think pho is a great idea. Also, oh my gosh, everybody on the West Coast, like, have you seen the, the photos of what it's like in the West Coast right now? It looks like Blade Runner. Or I was saying to Martin earlier that it's uh, inside of Doom. <laughs> Ugh. 
But it's so scary. I hope everybody's okay, and I hope the fire clears soon, and that you can open your windows. It's it's pretty intense. Um, gonna have a Netflix party tomorrow, so if you want to join our Netflix party, either uh, join my Patreon or DM me on Twitter and ask me for the link. It's it's pretty fun. We're gonna be finishing season one of Ugly Delicious together. Um, we have three episodes left. I don't know if we're gonna get through all three tomorrow night, but we'll do our best. Uh, so we're hoping to start at 8 o'clock, but if that changes, I will let you know, uh, what else is happening. I've been watching a little too much TV lately. Uh, I started watching Sister Sister that just came back, came onto Netflix, and then, uh, I'm on season two of Schitt's Creek, which I think is really funny. I don't remember if we, I, oh, I think we did actually acc accidentally skip an episode. Dang. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll take a look and, and make sure uh, we, I think, I don't remember which one we skipped, but I'll, I'll look, I'll look, I'll look. Okay, that's the business. Let's look at what people cooked this week. This is fun. This is always fun. If you want to be featured here on this part of the stream, just tag me in your photos on Instagram or Twitter um, or reply to my threads whenever I talk about the stream. Uh, I love showing what you're cooking or what you're seeing at the farmer's market or at the grocery store. Or if you see an ingredient, you're like, what do I do with this? You can just take a picture of it and ask me and I will put it here on the stream. Up first, Carly sent this lovely lemon curd. Uh, that was on my Patreon. So that was cool. I love seeing how, um, you know, my recipes turn out. <laughs> I mean, I write them and test them so they will turn out. It's just that I don't have the same exact kitchen as you, and I might not be in the same, you know, weather situation, or I might not have the same range. So it's really interesting to see um, consistency of a recipe in different environments. So that's what I mean when I say, oh, it turned out. <laughs> I don't mean that as like an insult. <laughs> but yay, Carly has some lemon curd in her house this week. Um, Tris sent over this... Uh, this salsa that he made a couple weeks ago, uh, not knowing that we were gonna talk about hot sauce today. So this looks really nice and roasty. Yes, yes and yes. Good job, Tris. Um, my cousin Chase is a freshly graduated college student um, at UC San Diego, and um, he's kind of diving into cooking for himself. So this is like a lovely pork katsu bowl with rice. Um, daikon radish, an egg, and some scallion. You go, Chase. I mean, I started learning how to cook in college, too, so I, I was a little, I was a little late. <laughs> yeah, it is fun to see how people interpret and recreate my stuff. I really appreciate it. Oh, and here's our first scheduled, uh chat post stream elements is asking if you're following me on social you can check out the links there i'm gonna edit this next time so it it uh separates the <laughs> it adds a uh, uh line breaks in here but uh this is all a test thank you for participating with me <laughs> trying my best trying my best um what else Vance is leaving his fancy cabin in Maine because the people who own it are coming back home from Japan. But he's been grilling every week, and we've got some freshly caught trout. Let me move that up for you. Some tomatoes and corn. That corn looks so good. Man, farm fresh corn is the best. Have you ever just bitten into a raw sweet corn cob before? It's very good. <laughs> I don't think he caught the trout himself, but I'll have to ask him next time I, I see him. Um, Dan Cooper from Twitter shared a chili bounty in honor of today's stream. These are all from his personal garden. And then he made hot sauce, of course. Duh, that's what you do. And then um, look at what else. He also had yellow wax beans and some fat bell peppers and some tiny tomatoes. Thanks for sharing that, Dan. Again, if you'd like to be featured in this segment of the stream, make sure to tag me on Instagram and Twitter with your food photos, and I will happily show and tell. You can also tell me stories and anecdotes, uh, failures and successes. I, I like hearing about that stuff. And I might have some, some advice about, you know, how to tackle uh, mistakes in the kitchen. You know, maybe, maybe. What was I up to this week? 
Let's see. Um, this atrocity. <laughs> so at the beginning of the summer, uh, Ghirardelli and the Feed Feed hold an annual s'mores contest. And um, for some of us editors and curators, they send us the chocolate to play with. And so I've been uh, experimenting with s'mores in a series on Instagram. So I have this is maybe my sixth sixth experiment. Uh, but this is a double chocolate cocoa puff s'more. So um, the magic of this is in the marshmallow. So it, you know the Rice Krispies treat recipe? I have it memorized um, now, you know, as an adult. But uh, if you follow the Rice Krispie treat recipe up until melting the marshmallows in butter, from that point, you can start mixing in whatever you want and then remold the marshmallows into squares or whatever shape you want. But um, so what I did is I melted down the marshmallows with lots of butter and then added cocoa puffs in a small in a smaller proportion than you would for Rice Krispie because I wanted to be a marshmallow that has cocoa puffs in it rather than a cocoa puff treat. Um, and so, of course, I torched it and put it on a graham cracker and I have two melted squares of Ghirardelli chocolate on top like they're crisscrossed. Um, they just released this white chocolate square that has caramel on the inside. So it's a milk chocolate square and then a white chocolate caramel square underneath. This was decadent as hell. I couldn't finish it. <laughs> it was also like as big as an, like a chip witch. Like it was, it was thick, like it was a big boy. Um, but it was a good experiment. I have a few more marshmallows that I'm going to play with, but I'm almost done with like this battery of tests with, with s'mores. But that was a fun thing to do. I mean, it makes sense. It's like the fall now, but whatever. Uh, have you all been making any s'mores this summer? Please tell me about them. Uh, this is mango ice cream that I made with condensed milk, heavy cream, and molasses. Um, this was like kind of a clean the freezer out kind of an ice cream. It turned out pretty well. I think maybe a little too sweet, but uh, I can always add, um, you know, uh, fruit on top or, or something like that to, to tone it down. Okay. Um, this was my breakfast this morning. It was kind of like a Mediterranean snacky plate situation. So I have like smashed fried potatoes on the right. Um, some chickpea tofu that I made. I eat it cold. Um, and then some lentils, mung bean, mung bean lentils, I mean, and then uh, some black garlic baba ganoush. That was decadent as hell, but worth it. <laughs> so here's a close-up of the chickpea tofu that I made. Um, this was hilariously easy to make. If you take one cup of chickpea flour and whisk it with one and a half cups cold water. That is a starter batter. Um, and then you boil another cup and a half of water and um, whisk that in until it becomes like a, um, like a sticky batter, sticky shiny batter. And then you put it into a oil loaf pan and that's it. And you can flavor it any, any which way. Like I put a little bit of uh, Thai green curry inside of it uh, with some powdered garlic, and it looks like, it looks like Japanese tamago, it, it looks like egg, it's crazy, it's pretty good. What else? Oh, sorry. Um, I've been cooking from that book I talked about on Sunday, uh, Vibrant India by Chitra Agrawal, and this is her peanut lemon rice with curry leaves. Um, I omitted the coconut because I'm allergic, but uh, this was so easy, so good. I mean, the curry leaves might be a little difficult to source, but um, otherwise it was peanuts and lemon juice, uh, black mustard seed. Um, what else? I don't remember. Turmeric, obviously, because it's yellow. <laughs> Um, but this was so good, and I haven't really had any meat in the house um, because I'm waiting to test more recipes for this project I'm on. But uh, I was like, there's no meat in the house. How am I going to get some protein? And I was like, oh, peanut rice. Makes sense. It's really good. Really, really good. And it's good cold, too, as like a side salad. Um, this I found at the bodega. <laughs> I mean, I guess it was about time that Cardi B was on some some 
chips. So jerk barbecue Cardi B wavy chips. It makes sense. I didn't buy them though. I was just laughing at it. <laughs> Has anyone tried these? No, um, there is no coagulant in the chickpea uh, tofu. Because the chickpea flour itself is activated um, when it hits boiling water. Crazy, right? That's that's a close-up. Like, this is... All you do is cool it off in the fridge, and then you can slice it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so good. Highly recommended. You can also treat it, like, exactly like tofu. So you can have, like, cold Szechuan tofu with, like, black vinegar and soy sauce. And then, like, scallion and chili oil on top. Um, it's really refreshing in the summer. Like, highly, highly, highly recommended. So, let's get to the biz. How is everybody? Oh, you don't get exciting chips in your corner store? I mean, New York is like the bodega, like, you know, uh, saturation point. We get all the beta snacks of all the brands. It's kind of my favorite thing to do whenever I was, I was on road trips is to go into the gas station because sometimes those peripheral gas stations had the weirdest stuff. <laughs> but New York, like, we, we tend to have a lot of really cool stuff in our boat, I guess, for sure. Plus, Cardi's local. Bronx. <laughs> so, do I sound okay, guys? Volume is okay? Let's put an egg on me. Let's poach it. Egg. Okay, so today we're going to talk about peppers and, relatedly, hot sauce. Oh, going home already? Bye. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, let's talk about peppers. This is a very, like... I don't know. In my mind, I don't like bell peppers, but I love chili peppers. Is that weird? There's something about the nasal that really bothers me. Um, so here's some long peppers for you and cayenne peppers. So the background of peppers, my friends. Let's talk about this. So it is from Nahuatl. So Nahuatl is Latin, like, way, way back way way back latin american or no uh yeah latin south american <laughs> way way back way way back so it's the pronunciation of the fruit of plants from the genus Capsa capsicum which are members of the nightshade family which is solanaceae um so that substance that gives chili peppers their intensity when you eat them or you know touch them with your fingertips and then touch them to your eye. Ooh, it's called capsaicin. And um, the related compounds are called capsaicinoids. What a good name. Isn't that a good like RPG name, capsaicinoids? So chili peppers originated in Mexico. Um, red chilies contain large amounts of vitamin C. Uh, other species contain significant amounts of uh, beta carotene. And uh, they are a rich source of vitamin B6. Did you know? So after uh, Christopher Columbus, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, ruined everything, uh, many cultivars of chili pepper spread across the world used for both food and traditional medicine. So cultivars grew in North America and Europe. Uh, they all derive from capsi capsicum annuum. Uh, those have white, yellow, red, or purple to black fruits, or chili peppers. When we say fruits, we mean the actual chili pepper. So in 2016, the world's production of raw green chili peppers amounted to 34.5 million tons, with China producing half of the world's total. Are you noticing a pattern with China producing a significant amount of the world's total of everything? It's massive, massive country. Oh my goodness. Um, so capsicum fruits have been part of human diets since 70, 7500 BC and are one of the oldest cultivated crops in the Americas. As origins of cultivating chili peppers are traced to northeastern Mexico some 6,000 years ago. 
So they're one of the first self-pollinating crops cultivated in Mexico, Central America, and parts of South America. Peru is considered the country with the highest cultivated capsicum diversity because as a center of diversification where varieties of all five domesticates were introduced, grown, and consumed before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. <laughs> so Bolivia is considered to be the country where the largest diversity of wild capsicum peppers is consumed. Can you imagine going to that farmer's market? Oh my god. Um, so... So Bolivian consumers distinguish two basic forms, ulupicas, so those are species with small round fruits, or arevivis, which are the characteristic long elongated fruits. So um, when Christopher Columbus and his crew reached the Caribbean, they were first the first Europeans to encounter capsicum, calling them peppers because they, like black pepper of the genus Piper, known in Europe, has a spicy, hot taste, unlike other foods. This is a misnomer. <laughs> the name pepper is totally wrong for what we know as chili peppers. Totally, totally wrong. The spiciness of black pepper is not the same compound. It is due, like, that spiciness you get from black pepper is from a compound called piperine. And so, uh, <laughs> it's most, it's more appropriate to call it capsaic capsicum or capsaicin or whatever um rather than pepper because it's just conflating the two compounds but they have nothing to do with each other yeah spice is nice i agree so i have a book excerpt here from the devil's dinner a gastronomic and cultural history of chili pepper let's see if i can find it devil's dinner here the take-up of chili in Europe's far north was only ever very limited. It made hardly any inroads into the traditional foods of Scandinavia, for example. While proximity to Near Eastern trade routes spread hot spice into the Central Asian republics of the former Soviet Union, European Russia took to chili pepper and its food only very cautiously. Even paprika appears only fairly sparingly in meaty soups such as Russian-Ukrainian solyanka, um, fast forward, fast forward. There was a migratory wave of Korean people into the eastern zones of Russia in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which made the dressed salads and condiments of Korean cuisine, particularly kimchi, popular throughout Russia. But as Korean food writer Chang Zhu Song observes in a paper published in the Journal of Ethnic Foods, Russian kimchi contains less chili powder as compared to that of contemporary South Korea and therefore is less spicy. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, so chili, what it bestows on food is not just a category of flavor, but that haptic sensation on the palate, technically known as chemesthesis. All food obviously mobilizes the sense of touch, but as soon as we put it in our mouths, but once swallowed, that sense is mostly gone. Chili continues to work on the tongue and palate long after its consumption. That's because its active components, that capsaicin that I mentioned earlier, and similar compounds to it, or capsaicinoids, stimulate the chemical sensi sensitivity of the skin, and especially unprotected mucous membranes, i.e. eyeballs, <laughs> lips, tongue, <laughs> activating the receptors that mediate the body's perception of heat and pain. Chili has an impact on the organism that goes beyond the two principal external senses involved in the consumption of food, namely smell and taste. So it starts to turn into a touch-sensitive thing, which is why people tend to be obsessed with chili peppers. Does that make sense to you? Hey, thanks for the follow, Ocho Robo. Welcome, new people. Nice to see all these new, f new names in the chat. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so, the spread of chili peppers to Asia occurred through its introduction by Portuguese traders, not Christopher Columbus. Um, they're aware of its trade value and resemblance to the spiciness of black pepper and promoted its com commerce to the Asian spice trade routes. So, Portuguese traders also had the mistaken thought that black pepper or piperine compounds were the same as capsaicin, but they are totally different things. Can we just rename all chili peppers to capsaicin? Capsicums. Ah! So, it was also introduced in India by Portuguese traders toward the end of the 15th century. In 21st century uh, Asian cuisine, chili peppers are pretty common across all diverse regions. So, 
I have an excerpt from The Chili Pepper in China by Brian R. Dot. Where would Chinese cuisine be without chili peppers, huh? Unimaginable. Um, there were no chilies anywhere in China prior to the 1570s. That's kind of crazy to think about, considering how old tofu and other Chinese dishes are. Those are thousands of years old. And so chili pepper was pretty late to the game, considering. So all varieties of chili pepper, from sweet to extremely spicy, from long and pointed to round, belong to species native to Central America. Blah, 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 blah. Um... Today, chilies are so common in China that many Chinese assume they are native. They are not. Uh, that's crazy. <laughs> crazy, crazy, crazy. What else in China here? They have a little full crime here. Red chili, pointed chili, spicy chili. So tasty. It's so cute. So tasty. <laughs> Let's see. Um, this is an explanation of how chilies became so popular, not just culinarily, but it was integrated into medical classification systems. Um, so uh, the chili pepper offers an excellent avenue for viewing the interconnections between elite medical literature theory, <laughs> literature theory and popular healing techniques. That's fascinating. Um, so it was used as a pharmaceutical cure against a wide range of maladies. Um, and it was also used as a dietary supplement for overall maintenance and good health. The earliest Chinese source to include chilies uh, is from 1591. Um, number of later texts also underscored how people like to grow chili plants in pots as decoration in their homes. Um, that's true, actually. I know a lot of people who just grow them not for eating, but because they're so pretty. <laughs> oh, they're even in revolutionary songs. That's how important chilies are in China. You see? Did you all know this? This is crazy. No, I won't be eating raw chili from the st in, on the stream, but I do have show and tell for later. Yeah, I probably will eat some hot sauce later. It's going to be like our version of hot ones. Right? Right? Um, so, there are five domestic domesticated species of chili peppers. So the main group from Latin America, Capsicum annuum, includes many common varieties such as bell peppers, wax peppers, cayenne, jalapeno, Thai peppers, chiltepin, and all forms of New Mexico chili. That includes the hatch chili. Capsicum frutescens includes melagueta, Tabasco, piri piri, and Malawian kambuzi. That sounds cool. Uh, Capsicum chinense includes the hottest peppers such as naga, habanero, datil, and scotch bonnet. Uh, Capsicum pubescens, it sounds exactly what you think it is, pubescens, includes the South American rocoto pepper. And then Capsicum bacatum includes the South American ahi peppers. So there are only a few commonly used species, um, but you know there are tons and tons of ways to prepare them. I'll, I'll get I'll get to that later, but um, let's see let's see. There are three general groupings when it comes to cooking them. So that like those five categories were the um, scientific classification, but when it comes to like actually working with them, there are generally three categories, which are bell peppers, sweet peppers, and hot peppers. So bell peppers, bear they don't have any spice whatsoever. Sometimes sweet peppers may have spice in them, um, or they might be, um, you know, shishito peppers or guernica peppers, um, but they generally are not spicy. Maybe one in 20 might be. And then hot peppers, which is a vast range of things. <laughs> um, num, num, num. So the quantity of that capsaicin, that compound that makes chili peppers spicy, varies by variety and on it depends on growing conditions. So any peppers that are like water stressed or like a little dehydrated they usually produce stronger pods. So when a habanero plant is stressed out um, and it doesn't absorb a lot of water, the concentration of capsaicin increases in some parts of the fruit. It's like a big defense mechanism. So when peppers are consumed by mammals like us, uh, capsaicin binds with your pain receptors in the mouth and throat. 
potentially evoking pain via spine relays of the brainstem and thalamus where heat and discomfort are perceived. So that intensity, that heat that you feel from chili peppers is commonly reported in Scoville heat units. On any bottle of hot sauce, you might see the letters SHU that stands for Scoville heat units. So historically, it was a measure of dilution in amount like a, of chili extract in a sugar syrup um, until it has become undetectable to a panel of tasters. But I think over time that proved a little um, like tongue fatigue, like t oh, tasting over and over again. Um, and so I think uh, they've changed the way they test that. Uh, but capsaicin is produced by the plant as a defense mechanism, like I mentioned earlier, against mammalian predators and microbes. So um, that, you know, they don't want you to eat it, but we're eating it because we love pain and we're masochists. <laughs> um, there, w there are now chilies native to Asia, but they came from Latin America in the 1500s. That's really late. They, but I mean, that they... they you know, proliferated. Ah, okay. So birds, this is really fascinating. Birds do not have the same sensitivity to capsaicin, mostly because they don't have like mucousy sensitive main membranes like us. Uh, they're just bony balls of feathers. And <laughs> um, so capsaicin targets a very specific pain receptor and birds just don't have it. Only mammals do. So chili, pe chili peppers that are eaten by birds, um, they possibly contribute to seed dispersal. We talked about seed dispersal last week. Um, some plants depend on animals to eat them and spread the seed in their feces um, and, you know, contribute to the evolution and uh, protect the uh, future generations of the species. It's fascinating. Um, a couple years ago, this is a cool story, um, there's a restaurant upstate called Blue Hill at Stone Barns, and they pride themselves on having their own, like, farm, and they source everything, you know, from, from inside the farm. And uh, Dan Barber, who is the chef there, he has an episode on Chef's Table, if you haven't seen it, but um, he did this experiment where he was feeding the chickens only chili peppers. And when the chickens were laying the eggs, the egg yolks were like, bright red so you can like if you have chickens you can start feeding them chili peppers and they won't feel a thing but their their egg yolks will start looking like the chilies cool right cool 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 so there is a um you know of course there's controversy when it comes to chili peppers um it's with the spelling so there's chili c-h-i-l-i or chile C-H-I-L-E, or Chili, C-H-I-L-L-I. So, Chili with an ending uh, with one L and one I. It's widely used uh, in Anglophone regions, especially here in the United States and Canada. Um, it's commonly used to refer uh, to Chili con carne. It's like the short version of it, so that can be confusing. Like, are you talking about the Chili, the fruit, or are you talking about a pot of Chili? <laughs> Chile with C-H-I-L-E is the most common Spanish spelling in Mexico and other Latin American countries and mostly around New Mexico, Arizona. Um, the chili denotes a thick, spicy, unvinegared sauce made from this fruit available in red and green varieties. And when I have them both on the plate, I call it Christmas. <laughs> uh... And then the, uh, the third spelling, C-H-I-L-L-I, -L -L -I, is the original romanization of the Nahuatl language word uh, for the fruit chili. And it's the preferred British spelling. So you'll know by how, uh, you'll know where someone is from by how they spell the word chili, which is dope. I love things like that. I don't think the eggs are spicy. I think it's that the chickens just digest all of it. They're like the goats of birds. <laughs> uh, and this blew my mind, this little fact. Chili pepper pods are technically berries. I've said the word fruit several times, but technically, chili pepper pods are berries. What the hell? What the hell, botany? I don't get it. Okay, so actually cooking with them. 
So when they're used fresh, they're most often prepared and eaten like a vegetable. Duh. Uh, whole pods can be dried and then crushed or ground into chili powder. And that's used as a spice or seasoning. Um, they can be dried to prolong their shelf life. They can also be preserved by brining uh, or uh, immersing them in oil or pickling them. And I've actually got some dried chipotle peppers here. Look at that. Let me, let me make my screen bigger so you can see. So you can get these from the store, usually in the Latin American aisle, or if it's a Latin American store in the chili aisle. <laughs> and the way you work with dried pods like this is you need to hydrate them before you work with them. So what I like to do is um, bring a pot of water to a boil, turn it off, and then hydrate the peppers in that. And then you'll, the, they'll be soft again, and then you can chop them up and use them however you need to. Um, I use that chili water as like um, a fortifier in, in broths or making rice. It's still perfectly good. Um, unless, you know, I'm making like hot sauce or salsa. But uh, yeah, that is how you use dried chilies. Um, so around the world, there are tons and tons of sauces and applications uh, for chili peppers. Like, what are your, some of your favorite chili pepper dishes, my friends? Please tell me in the chat while I go through these. Or let me know if you tried some of these or not. Have you had sambal? That's the name for chili paste in Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore. Um, Thai, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Thailand has curry pastes that contain lots and lots of chilies with lemongrass. Um, what else, what else? In the Philippines, we actually eat the chili pepper leaves. We use it in a soup called tanola. Um, they actually don't have any spiciness whatsoever. It's kind of like eating arugula. Um, I would not, however, go out into the garden and eat any, you know, just any chili pepper leaf. Um, some of them have toxins in their leaves. I would only do this with uh, red chili peppers or ask at a grocery store if you're, if you're not sure. Um, so in Korean cuisine, we have kimchi, of course, and gochujang. You like jalapeno poppers. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um... I'm sure lots of us in the chat have had kimchi, right? Right? Tons and tons of Mexican dishes. There's chili rellenos or stuffed chilies. Um, what else? Uh, salsa. All kinds of salsa. Roasted tomato salsa. Salsa verde. Um, there's a peanut salsa. There's a salsa matcha. Maca. That's what it's called. That uses a um, coma peño pepper from Veracruz. Um, in India, we have achar or pickles. Lots of curries have chili in them. Uh, da -da -da -da. In Italy, we have arrabbiata, which is a pasta sauce. It's, it's, that name translates to angry pasta. Also, there's puttanesca. Uh, Hungarian paprikash. All different kinds of curry, even Japanese curry, Filipino curry, or it's called kare kare, jambalaya, jerk chicken, kung pao chicken, mole, mole poblano. Um, there's a cured meat from Calabria called induha that has chili pepper in it. Uh, Pepperade is a dish from the Basque region of France uh, that uses the piment de esplet. Uh, sambal, I already talked about. Som Tom, that's from uh, Thai and Lao cuisine. And then this is a cool one. Um, Tavuk Kebabi, that uses mint and Aleppo pepper. That sounds so good. That sounds so good. Hot wings. Gotta get some angry pasta for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually allergic to Thai curries. I'm allergic to the coconut in it. But I can eat other curries. I can have Japanese curry or any curry that doesn't have, like, coconut in it. Hey, Robert. Nice to see ya. You made some salsa with hatch chilies yesterday. Mmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we gotta get some angry pasta. <laughs> I, I, I tend to order that if I see it on a menu unless I see, like, a really, like, a really cared-for uh, bolognese. 
Yes, hot wings. I tend to fall in the middle when it comes to hot wings because I'm a weenie and I want to eat more hot wings. I don't want to sit there while they get cold trying to recover from the first one. <laughs> How about banchan? You know, the Korean uh, crispy spicy wings. Those are so good. You know the secret to those? Cornstarch. Google it. I'm sure you can find, can find some stuff about it. Okay, so that is chili peppers so far. And naturally, we're going to move into hot sauce. <laughs> like my background for this? <laughs> this is such a natural fit, going right into hot sauce. So I've got a bunch of them. I'll, I'll go into more detail about this, but I have like ones that I haven't opened yet here. I got a maple roasted apple one. Literal fire. It's literal fire. Yes. Okay. Let's get through the history and technical stuff before I do my show and tell. Maybe I will do a mini, a mini hot ones and have some hot sauce and cry on camera. So continuing, um, fresh or dried chilies are often used to make hot sauce, duh, a liquid condiment. Uh, it's usually bottled when commercially available and then adds, you know, obvious spice to dishes. That's why people use it. Um, so hot sauces are found in many cuisines, including harissa from North Africa, chili oil from China, my favorite, Lao Gan Ma Chili Crisp. Um, this is also known as Rayu in Japan. Uh, sriracha in Thailand, and um, dried chilies are also used to infuse cooking oil, uh, as demonstrated in uh, Priya, uh, Priya Krishna's recipe for chunk, which is a finishing clarified butter with cumin seed and chili pepper. So hot sauce, aka chili sauce or pepper sauce, is um, a condiment, a seasoning, or salsa made from chili peppers and other ingredients. So I was surprised to see um, seasoning in here uh, defined under hot sauce. And then I found this. It's called De La Salt from Gemini Crow. Oh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll make, no, I don't want to make this good beer. De La Salt from Gemini Crow. Tropical spice makes everything nice. Sprinkle some soul on your next meal. Um, Scotch Bonnet Tropical Spicy Salt. So it's got some pink Himalayan salt with scotch bonnet peppers in it. So this is technically a hot sauce, but it's a salt. <laughs> um, so there are USDA grades of hot sauce. So like they have a grade A, which is known as fancy hot sauce. Grade C is a uh, standard and then there's substandard. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's like it's not bad i mean it's being manufactured for sale so it's still like something palatable but what they mean in quality here at the usda is um the freshness of the ingredients so substandard means they may have used canned tomatoes or canned peppers and not freshly picked you know and so a grade a would be a hot sauce from the brooklyn grange which is a local garden here that makes their hot sauce in-house something that is substandard or standard would be like you know tabasco or like something you would get in the cafeteria something that's not brand name um so that coloration in food grading specifically in chili sauces considers the coloration the consistency its character absence of defects and flavor it's really funny that absence of defect is like a, a categorizing thing but what that means is there are lots of production failures that can happen in um in food did you know there is an allowable percentage of bug parts in uh in food the usda has a measure like a percentage of allowed bug parts because you're working in a large factory you can't keep an eye on every little thing you're allowed to have like point point something percentage of bug parts in your food i'm not kidding that's crazy so i highly recommend buying local know your producers <laughs> damn the man and large-scale manufacturing um so i have an excerpt from hot peppers by richard schweid richard schweid so here, let's see. 
So there are three general categories of hot sauce on the market. So this is what I was explaining. The lowest quality is made by manufacturers who cut corners using 20th century food technology. Yeah, 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 yeah. Terrible sacrifice of flavor. Manufacturers rot gut hot sauce. They use dehydrated peppers, xanthan gums, coal talk colors, and other wonders developed by the modern food industry. Blech. Um, so the next step, or that middle standard, uh is price competitive. These are sauces that have been properly aged with no industrial additives. So no xanthan gum, uh, no preservatives. Um, the whole pepper is usually cayenne or jalapeno and ground fine. Seeds, husks and all and used in the hot sauce. This is the vin d'ordinaire, decent product at an affordable, at affordable price. So this is standard level by the USDA. So the highest quality and most expensive hot sauces, these are ones that I will say are priced probably more than $5. Um, like, for example, El Yucateo is priced at like two, three dollars. I would say the higher quality hot sauces are going to be around five, six to fifteen dollars, depending on the ingredients. Um, so the highest quality, most expensive hot sauces have the seeds and husks pulped out after the mash is aged. So it's, it's like more of a, a smooth consistency. Um, and so the product is rich, red, heavy, um, yeah, and so the discriminating hot sauce devotee will insist that the time and effort required for this process can be justified only when capsicum frutescens is used. Okay. Okay, so hot sauces are more than just hot. I alluded to this earlier when talking about peppers. Different varieties of peppers make sauces with flavors that range from exciting and full-bodied to dull and thin. As with wines, like it has a terroir, uh, the quality of the original fruit will, to a large extent, determine the quality of the finished product. Yes. Yes, and yes. So this is interesting. Part of the increased demand for hot sauce in the United States came as a result for the public's changing liquor taste. Vodka established itself as a favorite among the drinking population, and one of the most frequently consumed of all vodka drinks was the Bloody Mary. Its devotees insisted that it was not worth its vodka without a dash or two of hot sauce in the tomato base. Almost every bar in the United States has a bottle of hot sauce somewhere on the premises. Right? Doesn't that make sense? Crazy. Brunch made hot sauce happen in the U.S. Um, okay, so I have another excerpt here from Hot, hot Sauce Nation by Denver Nix. Let's see, Hot Sauce Nation from Denver Nix. So scientists believe that the chili plant most likely emerged out of the evolutionary soup in the small area of Bolivia. Yes, yes, yes. Bolivians today enthusiastically eat the Ulupica chili. Uh, la, 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 la. Because of the geographic and genetic proximity of the ingredients and people who make uh, ilawa to the ingredients and people who lived in the area in prehistory, um, this is the, fir the world's first hot sauce in Bolivia. Cool, 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 cool. Um, so one of the first commercially available bottled hot sauces in America appeared in 1807. That is fairly recent, y'all. Fairly recent. And this was in Massachusetts, not in the South. You would think that it would be in the South. Um, few of the early brands from the 1800s survived to this. They didn't survive. Uh, sorry, there's a fly. Oh, my God. Um, so... A lot of those early brands did not survive to 2020. Uh, Tabasco is the earliest recognizable brand in the United States, um, appearing in 1868. As of 2010, it was the 13th best-selling seasoning in the United States, preceded by Frank's Red Hot, yes, in 12th place, which is the sauce that first uh, created buffalo wings. Did you know buffalo wing sauce is simply Frank's equal parts Frank's Red Hot, and butter. Now, take that knowledge, add equal parts any hot sauce to melted butter, and you have your own custom wing sauce. Isn't that nice? Oh, yes, micheladas. I love a michelada, man. Hell yeah. So, got another excerpt from Rob Walsh from the Hot Sauce Cookbook. Let's see what Rob has to say. 
While pepper sauces made with Tabasco and cayenne peppers have long been associated with Louisiana, they weren't actually invented there. <laughs> New Hampshire farmer advertises cayenne pepper sauce in Boston in 1807. Pepper sauces in glass bottles were imported from England along with mustard and horseradish in the early 1800s. Much of what we know about the history of these early pepper sauces has been deduced from the study of antique glass bottles. That's really cool! Going to a thrift store and looking at glass antique bottles determining the history of chili peppers and hot sauce in America? That's pretty dope. <laughs> um, let's see, how, what else here? Uh, after the Civil War, Edmund Mc... Edmund McIlhenny McIlhen put his bright red Tabasco brand hot sauce in a cologne bottle and sealed it with green wax. Oh, my God. Uh, Tabasco was patented in 1870, and today it's produced by Sixth Generation Family Business, headquartered in Avery Island, Louisiana, That's which is pretty close to New Orleans. Uh, everything used in the early production of Tabasco sauce was produced on Avery Island. The island is an outcropping uh, of an underground salt dome. Excuse me? Wow. Fascinating. I went to the Tabasco store in New Orleans. It was great. <laughs> oh, and here's another, um, let's see, here's another book, People Who Love Hot Sauce, by Matt Garzinski. I did a lot of research here. I, this is a very dear subject in my heart. In Mexico, it was the anuum species that was most commonly domesticated. In the Amazon, the chinense and frutinense peppers could be found. Where exactly the idea to grind chilies into a sauce-like substance came from is uncertain. It's speculated the earliest hot sauce in the Americas was a simple blend of peppers and water, pulverized into sort of a paste and used as a tortilla dip. That's kind of where the word pepper water comes from. You might see that in some hot sauce shops. It also likely served as a preservative, which Mesoamerican cooks would use to coat their meats and other perishable foods, since there was no refrigeration until about the 1950s. Um, eventually, the recipes for chili-based paste evolved into mole, um, from the Nahuatl word meaning mixture. Dark, fruity variety called mole poblano is still a common fixture of Mexican cuisine. Yes, it is! Yes! Yes, yes, yes. Um, another excerpt here. Hot sauce's rise to nationwide popularity in the United States was due to large part in the work of groups who were historically most marginalized in the country. Yes, Queen, say it. In centuries after Columbus's arrival, enslaved Africans used hot sauce for medicinal purposes in ways similar to those that indigenous peoples had been employing for centuries before. Say it, yes. Uh, in the early decades of the 20th century, the great migration northward of millions of African Americans helped disseminate hot sauce across the continental United States. Thank black people for hot sauce. Yes. Thank you, and I'm sorry for everything. Um, what else? Uh, I think I got more. That's more peppers. Sorry. Let's, let's go back to the fire. Got distracted by the fire. But that's a great thought, right? Wow. Fascinating. Love this little bit of history. Um, so, actually making hot sauce. So, many recipes for hot sauce exist, but the only common ingredient is the variety of chili peppers. So, there are different ways to tackle this. Um, so, it usually starts with using the chili peppers as the base, and then as simple as adding salt and or vinegar. That's easy. Like, a really easy experiment you can do is um, take a clean jar and uh, cut up some chili peppers, take out the stem. You can leave the seeds if you like it really spicy, but take the seeds out if you don't like it spicy. Um, toss them in a bit of salt and then leave the jar on your countertop for two days. And then you've got fermented chili peppers. They're going to gather a little bit of water because salt leaches the moisture from the chilies. But that technically is a hot sauce. So from there, you can blend it up and uh, use that as a condiment as you wish. Or you can start to add vinegar and other aromatics. This is where you start to get crazy. Um, so other sauces use types of fruits or vegetables as the base and add chili peppers to make them hot. So that is the case in uh, Jamaican hot sauces. So a lot of those are fruit based like mango, um, banana, even coconut. 
Uh, manufacturers use different processes from aging in containers to pureeing and cooking the ingredients to achieve, you know, whatever desired flavor they're going through. Um, because of the ratings on the Scoville scale, or SHUs, spicier peppers such as the ghost pepper or habanero are sometimes used to make even hotter sauces or sold as extracts, uh, which boost, like, spiciness in the hot sauce that you're already making. You only need, like, one or two drops. Um... So other ingredients that you can use to boost a hot sauce, you can buy pure capsaicin, which I will have to say you have to wear gloves and some kind of eye protection if you use it and only use one or two drops ever because it's the pure compound of spice and that would hurt you. I think it would really hurt you. Um, another thing that people use to fortify their hot sauces is mustard oil. Until recently, I would say, um, there hasn't been a real... Um, food safe commercial mustard oil uh, it's mostly been uh, sold as like a beauty product <laughs> and people have been cooking with it which I don't think is a great idea but uh, people have been doing it for hundreds of years so um, only now we're getting like uh, food safe mustard oil um, but you know the most common ingredients in hot sauces are vinegars and spices um, vinegar is a natural preservative um, it can bring the pH down to uh, 4.6, which is um, pretty safe for canning. So long-term storage. I wrote an article for Yumly about um, canning. So, uh, or you can visit the National Center for Home Food Pre Preservation that's based at the University of Georgia to double check you know, those standards if you want to you know, experiment. So, um, Oh no, Lucius, your fingers still burn from handling peppers. This is, I, I use gloves. I mean, not everybody has that luxury because I'm a, I'm a caterer, but uh, I highly recommend buying a box of gloves in general. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, it'll help you handle hot things and gross things. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go through a list of some kinds of, of hot sauce. Let me know in the chat if you've had them before. So, um... Have you ever had a Marie Sharp's? Marie Sharp is a brand uh, from Belize. They use hot pepper, no, they use habanero, carrots, and onions as the primary ingredients. I've had Marie Sharp's. Um, in the Caribbean, there's a whole lot of them, whole, whole lot of them. Like I mentioned that their, their, their base is like fruit and vegetables. Um, but the most common peppers in uh, Caribbean hot sauces are habanero and scotch bonnet. Um, in Trinidad, there's a Trinidad Scorpion. Ooh. Ooh. In Barbados, we have Bahan Pepper Sauce with mustard and scotch bonnet. I've never had that. My mouth is watering. I want it so badly. Oh, gloves don't help when making pepper powder in a blender. You're, you're right. Oh, no, be careful. Don't pepper gas yourself. I've definitely done that to my eyes. Um, you just got to keep your head away. <laughs> Or let the dust settle for like five minutes before you open the lid. Don't open it right away. You can gas yourself. Don't do that. Um, in Haiti, we have tea, tea malis. Uh, that's made with habanero, shallot, lime juice, and garlic. And sometimes tomato. In, uh, in Puerto Rico, we have pique sauce or, and then uh, sofrito, which uses the small piquin pepper, like little tiny bird peppers. With annatto seed, coriander, onion, garlic, and tomato. Yum! Um, there's a brand called Don Ricardo, and I haven't had it yet. It's from Puerto Rico. Has anyone ever had that? Oh, good idea to do the pepper powder outside. Smart. Very, very smart. Um, in Jamaica, we have a uh, scotch bonnet sauce and pick a pepper. Pick a pepper is actually one of my favorite hot sauces I've ever had. It's like roasty and a little sweet but not too sweet i bought one bottle in um in austin i feel like i don't remember the name of this shop in austin i think it's called tears tears of joy or something like that it's on sixth street but uh every time i went to south by southwest i would buy you know a suitcase full of hot sauce this is before we had heatonist the shop in new york um but the only bottle to break on my flight home was the pick a pepper sauce from Jamaica, and I was devastated. 
So if anyone wants to gift me some pick a pepper sauce, I will happily accept. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Ocho Robo, you are right. It is one of my favorites. Um, in Chile, there is a brand called Diaguitas. Um, it's made from pure red or yellow Chilean peppers. So they have two different varieties, red and yellow. Um, and it's only with water and salt. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. There's also a creamy style, like aje crema or pebre style um, in Chile. That sounds so cool. Wow. I mean, okay, so there's going to be tons and tons from Mexico. So chipotle peppers are super, super popular. Those are the ones I showed you earlier at chipotle peppers. Um, vinegar is used sparingly or not at all in Mexican sauces. Um... Some sauces may have the seeds in it. Um, they also they also use annatto, or it's also known as achiote. I use it in Filipino cooking. Um, da, 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 da. The Spanish term for sauce is salsa, so that's what salsa means. It just means sauce. Doesn't necessarily refer to the fresh, you know, pico de gallos that you're used to seeing in photos. Um, what else? Uh, oh, here, here are some notable companies producing Mexican-style hot sauce. Buffalo, Cholula. Oh, Cholula Extra Garlic is one of my favorites, yes. Uh, Valentina, it's a popular one uh, where I'm from. Panama, uh, Picante Chombo de Elidas are the other brands. Cool. In the U.S., we have Tabasco, which is very vinegar, vinegary. Um, what else? Louisiana style. We have, uh, red chili peppers, vinegar, and salt. Sometimes xanthan gum and other thickeners. Uh, specific Louisiana hot sauces. Crystal. I love crystal. Uh, Frank's Red Hot. Hell yeah. Texas Pete. Trappies. I've had trappies. Uh, chili pepper water. That's usually in, uh, Hawaii. They, you can see, like, it looks like a whiskey bottle, like a, a whiskey um, shorty with uh, whole chili peppers inside of it with garlic, salt, and water. Yeah, it's very close to a Filipino, um, it's a dipping sauce called sausawan. Uh, I have a recipe on my website for it, and it is vinegar that is steeped in chilies, um, garlic, black peppercorn, and uh, dried fruit. Yum, right? Or calamansi if you can find it, but, you know. Uh, New Mexican-style chili sauces contain no vinegar, or almost no vinegar. Um, every New Mexican dish is served with either a red or green chili sauce, or like I say, Christmas. Uh, green chili, la 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 la. What else, what else? In Australia, what's going on in Australia? They have locally produced habanero and Trinidad scorpion sauces. Yum. Ah, the United Kingdom. Two of the hottest chilies in the world, the Naga Viper and the Infinity Chili, were developed in the United Kingdom. Holy crap. Um, and they are available as sauces which have been claimed to be the hottest natural sauces available in the world. The Naga Viper and Infinity were considered the hottest two peppers in the world until the Naga Viper was unseated by the Trinidad Maruga Scorpion in late 2011. I think that this is wrong. I think that um, the newest pepper is in the U.S. and it's called the X. And I've had a droplet of the X before and it made me um, trip like I was on mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, and this reminds me, um, I was a judge for the New York Hot Sauce Expo, and it is, I will say, the tasting panel was a majority of white men, white bearded men who all listened to metal. It was very interesting. I was the only woman of color in the room. Uh, but the way that it works when you're, when you're on a tasting panel for anything is we have to taste everything blind. I mean, not necessarily blindfolded. It's just that um, we don't know what sauces came from which bottles. And so we do a battery of testing by dividing all the sauces into categories. And so we each sign up for a category we want to specialize in. And then everyone has to participate in the, um, in the uh, what's it called? What's the hottest, not the ghost pepper, not the ghost pepper category, there's the next one, Carolina Reaper category. 
Um, so everybody has to participate in the Carolina Reaper category because uh, there usually is never enough data to judge because people drop out. So if everyone <laughs> gives their data for the Carolina Reaper, we'll have enough to know what was good. <laughs> it's really hard when you're judging really hot sauces because when, you're, when your tongue and your receptors are all flaring, my mouth is watery talking about it. So when you're suffering, you can't really taste anymore. And so how do we judge something when your tongue has been completely shot? I know, you need to drink some milk now, huh? I know, I know. So it was really fun to judge hot sauces. And I opted out of judging the, the X pepper category. They had 20 sauces. And uh, I was watching my friend Matt Timms go through it. And he was looking like Santa Claus, like his cheeks were so pink and he was sweating, visibly sweating. We had run out of milk by the time we got to that category and people were like spraying whipped cream into their mouths because that was the only dairy that we had. Oh my goodness. Uh, but uh, it was a fun experience and I hope that, you know, post quarantine we can get back to uh, hosting the Hot Sauce Expo. So how to generally make hot sauce. Like I said earlier, you can ferment some peppers on the countertop in salt. Uh, for two days. You can also uh, ferment it in a salt brine for up to seven days. Um, and then after that, you can uh, strain off the brine and use it for something else. Uh, mash up those peppers in a blender or a food processor. Uh, add vinegar. And you can either cook it down or leave it as is, but consume it within the week. Um, if you're going to preserve it, I would advise that you add more vinegar to help... Uh, you know, kill off any toxins. I mean, capsaicin is a spicy thing, but it might not kill off um, microorganisms. So you just be extra careful and use um, vinegar to your liking. Um, you can make chili oils or hot oils. A uh, popular Chinese method of making spicy oil is um, putting the herbs and spices in a bowl, like in a heat safe bowl, and then heating oil to boiling and then pouring the boiling oil over the spices instead of frying the spices in the oil because you might burn it, you turn off the heat and just uh, stir the hot oil into it. Um, you can also just have hot vinegars, which is using significantly more vinegar than the chili peppers themselves. And then like I said earlier, you can make hot salt. So what I would do with that is if you're harvesting your own peppers, I would blend them up and mix it with a salt of your choice and then uh, get a sheet pan, uh, spread it out flat and let it air dry uh, until you can break it apart. And so that's how you make hot salt, y'all. So uh, in the chat, can y'all handle spice? I can handle pretty, I can handle a lot of spice actually. I just have to ramp up to it. It's kind of like riding a bike. Um, have you all seen that show Hot Ones where celebrities answer questions and they eat increasingly spicy wings? I'll turn my, I'll change my screen to a bigger, so you can see the hot sauces. So these are the unopened ones that I have. Um, this is f called Poor Devil Pepper Company, a smoke shifter, brown sugar, all spice, and thyme. Look at the artwork on that one. I would have this with some wings. Hot sauce, like wine, has, you know, its own class of terroir and pairings. So, uh, you know, I would have beer with that one. Uh, this is this one I use a lot, the Lao Gan Ma Spicy Chili Crisp. This is pretty available at uh, Asian grocery stores. Um, they use um, dehydrated black beans in this for the crispy part. So it's like a crunchy sauce. Um, it's really good. I put it on everything. It's a friendly sauce. If you're if you're not very good at handling spice, like this is a, a good starter. So Mama O's kimchi paste. So this is different from gochujang. It does contain gochujang, but um, this is a ready to go kimchi paste. So this you can use to slather onto um, cabbage, onto daikon radish, onto whatever you want, and it will kimchi itself. <laughs> But um, kimchi paste itself contains gochujang, um, dried fermented shrimp, you know, onion, shallot, garlic, all that. So it's already blended in this brand, Mama O's. Full disclosure, I am friends with this, this person. So, <laughs> so 
Sorry. Um, what else? Unique Destiny Maple Roasted Apple. Guaranteed to cure bland food. This is from dragonsbloodelixir.com. This one's more of a sweet one. I would have this on chicken. Oh, you're not a big fan of spicy foods? Well, cool. um, this one I haven't opened. This was from a local Oregon uh, company. It's called Sal Noi Chili Oil with Lemongrass. So fuel your senses with our fiery and savory chili oil. So this is rice bran oil, onion, garlic, lemongrass, Thai chili pepper, distilled vinegar, cane sugar, sea salt, and paprika. Ooh, you've got some jalapeno, Tabasco, and cayenne peppers you're waiting to turn into some sauces. Very nice. Very, very nice. I have an all-purpose that I'll show you. So I'm going to show you all the ones I haven't opened, and I'll show you the ones that I have opened. So again, here's the de la salt. You can make your own spicy salt also at home. Just blend up your peppers, mix it with some salt, and then let it dry on a sheet pan until you can, you can uh, break it up. So let me go grab some fresh sauces that I've opened already. Oh boy. Oh, Jen. What's going on? I have a lot. I have a lot. Okay. <laughs> so whenever there's a hot sauce expo, I, uh, I always tell myself, I'm not going to buy. I'm not going to buy more sauce because I have to use up all the sauce in my house. Um, but I always walk out with 15 to 20 new bottles. I think on average I go through 10 to 12 in a year, and then I have, like, lots of leftovers, um, but it's fun, you know. So this one I've made, um, I made fresh last week. I fermented for five days, and then I used, uh, Nardello pepper, uh, Thai bird, uh, jalapeno, I, I, I made it really basic. I used a lot of garlic, but uh, it's really, it's, it's just an all-purpose sauce. It's pretty good. Um, this one I've already opened. This one's from Northwest Elixirs, Bangkok Hot. Um, so this one, spicy, sour, and sweet for fish, noodles, and other light fare. So this has rice wine vinegar, Thai chili, agave, garlic chili flakes, uh, green chilies, ginger, lemongrass, fish sauce. This one has fish sauce. Hell yeah. Uh, coriander and basil. This one's from Portland, Oregon. NW Elixirs. Um, this was a really nice and fruity one that I would classify as a uh, Caribbean style. This is a uh, voodoo chili non sequitur apple and orange habanero hot sauce. It's very good. Not offensive. Um, oh, I'm making uh, messes. This is real good. Like, you can see that it's almost gone. This is Hellfire Detroit Chili Pepper Mansana. Has 15,000 to 30,000 Scoville units. Pretty good, pretty good. You only need a little dab. You only need a little dab. So it has a Scoville scale on the back here. Wimpy is 100 to 1,000. Mild is 1,000 to 5,000. Hot is 5,000 to 50,000. Yikes, 50,000 to 360,000. And deadly, 350,000 to 2.1 million Scoville units. Hellfire Detroit, what a name. And then I have another all-purpose one that I like, I've been using lately. Um, this is Horseshoe Brand Maple Cayenne from Crown Maple. So Crown Maple is a maple syrup company and they have a hot sauce collaboration. So there are a few hot sauces that I love, 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 but um, obviously have run out of them because I, I, I ate them and love them so much. Um, if you can find it online, um, Love Boat Extra Garlic is my favorite. Or Love, I think it's just Love Hot Sauce. It's got a Cholula-like te uh, texture. And then there's another one that I really don't like the name and I really don't like the branding, but it's delicious. It's called Dirty Dick's Hot Sauce. I hate the name. But um, it's, it's tropical fruit. It's a Caribbean style. Uh, Caribbean style uh, hot sauce. It's really, really good. I can identify it blindfolded for sure. 
Um, and then, exactly, uh, this is the third one I was about to mention, Jersey Barn Fire Black Garlic Hot Sauce. It's so good. I go through two bottles of that a year. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right, Diego. Hi, Diego. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hot Sauce has the worst branding because it's made by, you know, six-foot white guys with metal beards. We need to, de you know, democratize ties and diversify the hot sauce world yeah yeah it'll be like hellfire ass burning or something terrible um there is a brand that is very prevalent in in the hot sauce world i hate the name i hate the name it's called pucker butt it's unfortunate i don't you can tell women didn't name these <laughs> gross but anyway that's my my show and tell of hot sauces I know, it's so gross. So gross. Um, so, that's all I have on hot sauces and and uh, chili peppers. I hope that was informative. I really liked uh, researching that. It's something that I, I pay attention to and like I'm very active in that community. Um, but now, for those of you who are new to this stream, we're going to do our pretend chopped simulation. So if you're new to the chat, um, at this time, I love asking for three or four ingredient suggestions, and we're going to pretend to be on Chopped, that TV show where there's a mystery basket and there's three or four ingredients in there, and you have to use all of them in a dish. So uh, those of you who are new to the chat, I would love your suggestion of an ingredient for us to mentally play with. It can be anything. You can throw us a curveball. Uh, I would love a protein, um, you know, or maybe something that I mentioned today on the stream. And then we can all work together to figure out, you know, how would you use all three of those together? Anyone can participate. You can also just try to combine two of the ingredients. Uh, it's just the whole exercise is just helping to helping us understand, like, how far can we take an ingredient and maybe inspire you for dinner. OK, Martin out the gate. We got habanero as our first suggestion. We have two more suggestions from the chat. That would be great. That would be great. Okay, let me ask Magic 8-Ball if I should eat uh, a hot sauce. Nah, mate. Oh. <laughs> That's funny. Amazing. All right, we need two more ingredients for our experimental episode of Chopped. We've got habanero. So while I wait, let me tell you about habaneros. Um, we can have them fresh. We can steam them. We can grill them. We can pickle them. We can make a sauce out of them. We can dehydrate them and make them into a powder and use that as a breading for something. Just need two more ingredients to mash up together and then we'll get going. Habanero is a good start. Okay, you know what? I'm going to get some of my taster spoons and I'm going to taste hot sauces while I wait for more suggestions in the chat. Where is it? Where are my taster spoons? Where are my taster spoons? Carrot. Great. Thank you, Field Effect. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for joining us today, too. You are welcome here. Okay, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna try a Hellfire Detroit. We need one more ingredient. Black beans. All right, friends, let's do this. How would you mash up habanero, carrot, and black beans? Think of all kinds of formats, too. Don't just think obvious, you know? Uh, like a side of beans. Let's think of, you know, all the different ways you can prepare beans. So beans can be also dehydrated. They can be made into a chili. They can be made into a paste or a dip. They can be, uh, what else? Black beans. You can do a black bean salsa. You could do uh, Korean style black beans. Have you ever had that? Those are sweet. Yes, we could do a bean burger. 
absolutely a spicy habanero black bean bean burger. Yes, good start right out the gate. It's gonna be like hot ones. I'm just gonna eat hot sauce while we, we talk about possibilities. Here we go, Hellfire Detroit. Ooh, that is spicier than I remember. By itself. I'm usually having it with eggs. You know? Ha! So going from there, we have a bean burger. You could do um, vegetarian meatballs or vegan meatballs even. You could do um, a vegan, like, meatloaf situation with it. Um, carrot habanero salsa, yes. We could do um, a bean dip with roasted carrots. Like a habanero bean dip with roasted carrots. Let's see. Um, is there a pasta dish we could do? Is there a soup? We could do black bean soup. With like a habanero, pickled habanero on top and pickled carrot. Yeah. So beans, so you know falafel is made from uh, chickpeas. So you could apply that same logic of grinding up the black beans and making black bean falafel. And we could do like a garlic habanero sauce uh, like you would get in a pita. With shredded carrot. Yeah. Um, how about a salad? Can you do a salad? You could make like a black bean cracker and, and do that as like a topping for a salad. Oh, you could do tlayuda. Actually, uh, that purple sauce on a tlayuda is beans. So you can make a, tla a tlayuda. For those of you who don't know what a tlayuda is, it's like um, a giant pizza taco <laughs> from Oaxaca. <laughs> it's a giant tortilla that has a, a bean spread on it and then it's dressed with cheese and um, sauces and then you fold it and eat it. So it's like a giant pizza thing and then you fold it and eat it like a taco. It's amazing. It's so good. Oh, and the chat j also s shared my, um, my Patreon. Yeah. That's where uh, you can subscribe for $2 a month to get recipes every week. So that's four recipes a month. And there's an archive of 88 recipes. So lots of things to cook. Anyone else have any other ideas on how to mash up carrot, black beans, and habanero? I mean, obviously, we'd have to make a hot sauce. Obviously. Can make a black bean chili. Um... Oh, one of my favorite things I discovered was uh, carrot elote. Hi, Hufflepunks. How are you? We're trying to mash up black beans, carrots, and habaneros, pretending we're on chopped. Hmm. How else? How else would you enjoy black beans that are not obvious? Like, could you make a dessert? I don't know about black bean ice cream. That would be a little too grainy, I think. Oh, but you could definitely do a chocolate cake with black beans. I've had that. That's, that's pretty good. Like a, a vegan chocolate cake with black beans. Oh, you can make a flour out of dried black beans. So you can make cake batter. I know that sounds crazy, but possible. Totally possible. My phone is being crazy. Oh, you've had black bean chocolate brownies. Hell yeah, we could do a black bean chocolate brownie with like candied candied habanero and candied carrot. You could caramelize the carrot also as like a garnish. That'd be pretty good. We can make a salad. We can make um, carrot noodles and toss it in like a habanero vinaigrette. Yeah. And then have some, like, crunchy black beans. Yeah, candied habanero sounds really good. Hmm. This is great. These are all great ideas. Last call for ideas, friends. What else can we make with carrot, jalapeno, and black bean? 
awesome. I love this exercise. It's my favorite thing. Awesome. Well, friends, I think I'm going to call it for today. Thanks so much for hanging out. I, I'm seeing a lot of new names in the chat, and I really appreciate all your feedback and, like, participation i know that's like a lot of like dry history when it comes to like food stuff but i'm really really into it so if you missed the first half we talked about um the history of chili peppers or i will now from now on call caps capsicums um because pepper is a misnomer um and I talked extensively about hot sauce how to make it where it comes from um the history of how it proliferated in the u.s it's really fascinating stuff. I'm going to upload the archive to youtube.com slash J-E-N-N-D-L-V. If you'd like to hang out with me again, I'm going to hang out on Sunday and talk about zines and cookbooks. Uh, that one's more of an unplanned stream where I just like leaf through things and read recipes to you, um, which I think is super fun. And then I'll be back again next Wednesday to talk about food. Um, if you have any suggestions or have a cooking question, I'll happily research and answer it. Um, we do have some questions about like allspice um, and ranch dressing, but if you have something more urgent that you have in your CSA that's that's um, that you need to cook off, like I'm happy to uh, look into that and prioritize it. If you have any cooking questions throughout the weekend or before the next stream, make sure to follow me on social. That's my username, Randwiches. You can always ask me, um, you know, how do I use this up? Am I doing this right? Is it supposed to look like this? Like, I'm on call to answer your cooking questions. If you'd like to support the stream, you can either subscribe to me on Twitch here or join my Patreon. There's a link here in the chat. Um, happy to hang out with y'all. I will see you either on Sunday or next Wednesday. Uh, please be safe. Uh, have a relaxing rest of your evening. And I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. I like you. Hooray. Oh. <laughs>